Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. The Lord is good. The Lord is good. And all the time. Yeah, I was doing my best to hide my face from meeting people because whenever I peeped, I could see Elder Mayanka and he just kept looking down. I looked there, I looked at Elder Godwin and all my friends. I said, ah, it's good to be back here. Praise God. It's wonderful to come here and enjoy the blessings that has, the Lord has set um, right for us. Thank you for the kind introduction, Elder Sylvester. I also want to thank the pastoral team for seeing it fit that I may be able to come and stand here. Um, I love this music that I've been sung by the little girls together with the choir. Mungu atarudi na kuni ponge, pongeza. Even the, the lady who did the, the children's story, yeah, she nailed it and said, God has given us a responsibility to go and preach out there. Um, as the custom is, I just want to bring my greetings from uh, Machakos University District. Mepokea. I serve in a very big place. Um, and let me just tell you that I serve in about 16 congregations, but I like to ride on the Machakos University District. Amen. <laughs> I am a PCM damu. I will not tell you the names of my village churches, but uh, there are so many, but I was there last Sabbath. They told them I'll be coming to the city. Mepokea. You know, it's good to be back to the city because... Uh, uh, you know, I, I was just reading some posts this morning online that if Paul was to write a letter to Nairobi, he could have said, Nairobi. <laughs> so, 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 and I'm like, oh, hey, this is Nairobi for sure. I, I, I spent the night here in Nairobi and I felt the cold weather. In the morning I was like, should I nini or not nini? But anyway, God gave me the grace to nini. Amen? <laughs> yeah, this is wonderful to be back here and to... To see very many people here, I can see there's great development around. Um, I know God is still doing, and He still do greater than this. Um, I have learned that people may forget your sermons, but may not forget your service. And um, I know as I, before I left here, I was mostly in chaplaincy. You may have not forgotten that, that I'm a chaplaincy dam. Um... And because of that, I remember my borrowed, uh, my borrowed beatitude. I said, blessed is a preacher who takes the short time that he shall be invited again. Now I am back, but I'm not take, going to take a short time. Because it's taken three years before he invited me back. So I'll make sure I preach like I'll come here after three years. And, 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 and uh, uh, I've come to reclaim my time. I wish the pastors were here. I could have told them, you know, I didn't finish preaching. So today I've come to reclaim my time. To complete what I started. So um, just relax. If you're having seat belts, just funga vizuri, tighten it, tighten it, get some water. Uh, the waiter will be serving you with some water so that we do this together. Buona sifir. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I was glad when they said, let us go to the house of the Lord. Enter his gates with thanksgiving in your heart. Enter his courts with praise. For I'd, I'd, I'd rather spend a day in the court of Lord than to spend it out there, outward there. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And he says, my house shall be called a house of prayer. Let's pray. Jehovah, we thank you for wrestling with us and setting us up to stand, to speak this word in a time as this. You've drawn us together that you may help us listen to your word, Lord. I, how I pray that more of you may be seen, more of you may be heard. And Lord, let this message be the very word you wanted me to speak in Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Um, I, my family is somewhere in the congregation. I, I failed to mention that. They are somewhere and... Um, You'll see them over lunch hour. God has blessed us. Um, I remember the last time I was here when I was still, I said, I, do, I don't sleep on the what? On the job, yes. So we are not just, we are, we are, we are, we are, we are building the nation. We are preparing people for heaven. Buona <laughs> sifio. Well, more often than not, God has always spoken to us through various means. And sometimes God launches a discussion with humanity by the use of questions. He 
asks you questions, not because he failed to be or he ceases to be omniscient, but some, sometimes God asks us a question to call about our attention and to probably to see if you still have affection on him. Now, the Bible story that has read to us is from the book of 1 Kings chapter 19, and the title of today, today's sermon is, What Are You Doing Here? Maybe as I'll be continuing to share the word of God, it's a question you want to ask yourself, what are you doing here? I want to give you a story of a lady called Raminata. Raminata was born in the early 1820s in America. And um, of course, later on, she, she lived in Maryland. And later on in life, in 1844, she would get married to a man called John Tubman. Therefore, as time goes by, she'll adopt her mother's name, Harriet, and the husband's name, called Tub, Tubman. So she's called Harriet Tubman. Harriet Tubman is known to be a very powerful lady because of the impact she made during her time in the United States of America. During her stay, she got married to this free man. This guy was free. He's a free man during slavery time. He was a free man, and probably you'd expect maybe by the fact that she's married to someone who's free, she'll also be free. Quite unfortunately, uh, in the year 1849, it was made so clear that she would be now be sold to other places. And so what she did, she fled from being sold. She ran up northwards from where uh, people could accept people there they were. And because in her heart she felt that there was a need to come back and save other people, Harry Tubman still came back to win other people and bring them out of slavery. She made several trips, saving people from their cotton farms and including some of her family members. In, in, 19, in 1851, Tubman is remembered very clearly for having come back. Got the name Moses. Why? Because she was able to save people from slavery into the promised land. Maybe she knew why she was here, and that is why she made an impact in her life. Harriet Tubman escaped slavery to become a leading abolitionist, which I think Teddy will explain in the afternoon. You know, I, my, my, I don't know law. I know only the Ten Commandments. And, 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 and as time went by, she came again and joined other, pastors, other people in 1858 to bring more people from slavery. She set it so clear that her life was to save many people. In fact, her life theme was to save as many people. So she ended up saving very many people because of a calling. This woman is known to, be, to have been the first woman to lead, uh, to lead us, uh, what do you call it, armed expedition during a time during the Civil War. One thing I like so clearly that Harriet never lost any life during her escapements. She just went, went back, brought people, but she never lost any life. She will later die in 1913 of pneumonia. Of course, she was also old. When Harry died, she was given, she was buried by aunt. She, they gave her some honors because of what she did. Just the other year, 2016, when Obama was the president, he was, she was recognized as a national hero. And what did they do uh, as a result of that? They were able, the U.S. Treasury team department announced that her image will replace the image of Andrew Jackson in the bill, in $20 bill. If you look at the bill of the 20, I don't know, I had asked these people to project. If you look at the $20 bill, her name was there to replace this other person. Why? Because of the acts she performed during her time. This woman risked her life by being a woman. She risked her life by being a a, 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 an African-American, but within her heart was the passion and desire to win so many people to bring them from slavery. Today we are tasked with a question, what are we doing here? Can we say without fear that we know why God has called us to sit and to serve in this place? Slow down, Douglas. Beloved of God, we come across many stories of the, in the Bible of very many people who made an impact in life, people's lives. 
We have biblical patriarchs, probably Joshua, who made, led, led people to the promised land. We have Moses, whose impact is known to date. We have prophets who God used as his spokesman to go to different places, even how, no matter how risky they are, God was willing to go with them. Our key text came from the book of 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 9. In my new King James Version, it's read like this. And there he went into a cave and spent the night in that place. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing here, Elijah? The consistency of the previous chapters, probably from 17, 18, and 19, we consistently see the main protagonist being Elijah. Elijah, you can see the activities he had because by chapter 17 of the book of, uh, of First Kings, we can see that he's, God is using him to help a widow. He's helping her to also raise a child. God is helping uh, through Elijah. God is feeding him. And God is still doing so many things in life through this prophet Elijah. Elijah is a powerful, what I could say, he's a buzzword or a household name. Yondio Kusema. Elijah is known for the many things he comes to do in his life. And I want, in particular, I want to make mention that it features, it features in all, most of these Abrahamic uh, religious sacred writings. For instance, we find, the name, we find Elijah's be, Elijah being mentioned in the Quran. And in Quran, the main thing he's speaking about is going to speak against people worshipping Baals. He is a profound person. He is a powerful gentleman. We find Elijah in the Judean sacred text where Ben Sirah quotes him for having, he is a precursor of the Messiah. Elijah is not only spoken of in the Quran and the Judaic text, he's also mentioned the Christian text. May I also remind us that this is the same person that was fed by ravens. We are talking about a someone who I've just mentioned was there to revive a widow's son. We are talking about a sum, someone who beat a horse in a race on foot. You mean, imagine running and beating a horse. Elijah was powerful. He's someone who got so it fit that he can speak about, against tyrannical monarchy. We're talking about someone in the New Testament that did so profound things. In fact, in the um, transfiguration of Jesus, we see Elijah being mentioned. Elijah is mentioned several times in the Bible, and more particularly in this last text that I want to mention, James sums up the New Testament by mentioning Elijah that he was a man with a nature like ours. Elijah was someone with a nature like us. He prayed and stuff happened. You know, you know when I look at myself, how weak sometimes I am and how, how big I am, I'm told that he had a nature like mine. When I see how, how, how pointy I am, I'm told he had a nature like mine. When I see how sometimes I'm afraid, I'm told Elijah had a nature like mine. He spoke and things happened. Basically, he had faith, but then also Elijah had fears. What are the things that come to your mind whenever you face challenges in your life? I'd like us to now probably zero into chapter 19 of the book of 1 Kings chapter 19. I'll read from verse 4. When I'm fast, please slow me down. Sometimes I rush so fast. Say it's verse 4. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat under a broom tree. And he prayed that he might do what? Die. And said, it is enough. Now, Lord, take my life for I am not, I'm not better than my father's. This is the same person God has pursued, done great things through his life. But it gets to the point where he's like, uh-uh, God, it's enough. I, I, I have heard this before even in our congregation when people feel like, uh, I've done this several times, it's enough. But you know, guys also say that I am tired. I, you, rarely will you hear people say that they want to die. But this guy is discouraged as a powerful prophet. This powerful prophet is suicidal. What am I throwing to you? I want you to catch what I'm throwing. That even men of God get tired and discouraged. 
It means even men's God, God's people get fearful. God's people sometimes run away. Elijah, he's telling God, man, you know what? I want to die. He's getting this suicidal thought. You know, the Bible mentions many people who are suicidal. If you read the book of Exodus, you find a Moses who wants to die. He's suicidal. You look at David, who was suicidal. You look at Job, who was suicidal. Judas was suicidal. In fact, he died. Samson and even Saul. All these people get to the thought of, you know, dying. Elijah is discouraged. Elijah is depressed. He feels alone. You know, the present life we are facing, even as a country, may make you feel depressed. Maybe you are not. You know, this time you get, you get to buy this oil at 900 shillings. You go back tomorrow, it's 1,500. And your salary is the same. You know, sometimes, you guys, I know you guys in Nairobi have cash. But some, some of us in the village there, you, you, you go today like, what? This is the same thing, I bought the same price, and the price shoot. And sometimes even with the many, a lot of money, even Nairobians, you know what, what amazes, what amazes, let me just take a commercial break. Let me take a commercial break. The other day I was so excited. I, I, I was watching, I think, something in news. I saw people in Nairobi, they also queue for fuel. They queue for fuel, and they're in Nairobi. I was so excited, and I was in Machakos, very old, fuel was in abundance. I was like, okay, Nairobi, a queue. You know, there's an advantage of being in the village, by the way. So we, we, we see that sometimes the challenges of life can make you depressed to the point of death. I was, doing a, I was reading a research by World Health Organization. They say that in a year, about 800,000 people died of, died of suicide. 800,000 died of suicide. I know that those are just the, but a few that are being recorded. There are also many who do attempt to commit suicide that are not recorded. And you know, as I did to read further, I discovered even in Kenya, that it's been on the rise. Between 2017, 2018, you find that it has gone up to 58%. Many people are suicidal. They may not have told you, but they are. I, I serve in a campus ministry where I, I don't think ever since I started serving, I don't think a year can go without me hearing that a student committed suicide. It happens. And sometimes it's our family members, and you hear they're tired of life. People are depressed. People are tired. Elijah, the servant of God, is representing you. When you feel depressed, remember Elijah. And now we get to hear that many people die because of that. So they were told even in Kenya, at least around four people in a day die of suicide. In Kenya, I know the medics that are inside here can confirm that. But now look at the situation that I'm in. I'm the chaplain of an institution. What, how do I manage the many people who've lost life, hope? You are but one chaplain and many depend on you. You are but one leader, but many are having these thoughts. And sometimes because you're just like Elijah, you also have your own depression. Beloved of God, Elijah was discouraged. But why was he discouraged? Let's go to chapter, chapter 19, verse 1. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. What had Elijah done? Ah, Elijah is a very powerful guy. In verse eight, chapter 18, Elijah had gone and invited all the gods. Yeah, I call them gods. The prophets of Baal, they were told to line up there. And they were told, you know what? Put everything, pray that fire may come and consume your bull today. And Elijah watched them. You know, I like the way he does his, his thing. Elijah says in chapter 18, in verse 6, 26, so they took the bull which was given them, and they prepared it, and, and they and called on the name of Baal, morning, evening, till noon, saying, Oh, Baal, hear us. But there was no voice. Take note, there was no voice. No one answered. Then they leaped about the altar, which they had made. And so, verse 27, you know, Elijah also had a sense of humor. Verse 27, and so it was at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, cry aloud, for he is a God. Either he is meditating, or he is busy, or he is on a journey, 
or perhaps he's sleeping and must be awakened. No, it's like, you know, your phone, your, your God's phone is in danger. You try to call your God, he cannot be reached. Sorry, the subscriber of this cannot be reached. That is what... That is what Elijah is going through when he's speaking to these people. And he's telling them that your God is probably gone for a walk. But you know what will happen eventually? Elijah and his people will set up, they'll set, they'll do, they'll set up the altar very well. And in the evening they'll pray and fire will come up and consume the offering. Praise God. You know, if you don't speak to me, I'll start speaking in Swahili because I usually preach in Swahili. I'm just trying to read the notes here because my English is gone. So, <laughs> praise God. <laughs> and what's happening here is that we find that these people are praying and this offering is consumed. And, you know, when Elijah does that, he'll invite all those people, prophets, and they'll be killed. And Ahab will go and tell Jezebel. You know what this guy did? What this guy did? Verse 9, chapter 19. And Ahab told Jezebel, all that Elijah had done, also how he executed all the prophets with a sword. Verse 2. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So let the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow. He saw, he saw, that, he saw, that, he, he saw that he arose. Verse 3. And when he saw that, he arose and ran for his life. And went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servants there. When he heard of this, woman in, this woman's intention, Elijah arose and ran. Imagine after God has taken him through all these things. Why would he run? This guy has preached and there's a sermon. You know, it's just like the other day when you saw... Uh, uh, on the, during the Oscars, you, you, you see that uh, you're given a Will Smith slap. You know, what, you know what I'm saying, if you understand it very well. When things are getting better, and that's when you come to be slammed. You know, that's what he was told by, I think, I forgot the name of this guy. But I'll remember, I'll tell you. And then he slapped. When things seem to be up there, that's when this guy starts running. He felt alone and felt like the work is done. You know what, beloved of God? It's not done. It's not over until the Lord says it's over. You know, I, I, I was reading something by this quote by Billy Graham. He says, the will of God will not take you where the grace of God will not protect you. Amen? The will of God will not take you where his grace will not protect you. I mean, wherever you are, no matter how difficult life seems, as long as God is present there, no matter how things seem like you're like, give up, as long as God is present there. Where just when Elijah thought that he was, it is over, it is when God was getting started with him. Sometimes you want to give up in your ministry and what God has called you to do, but that's just when God is about to do something great in your life. So don't give up, because when he felt discouraged, you'll read when you have time, you'll discover that's when he'll be, they'll send an angel to wake him up and tell him, Elijah, get up, eat, man, eat. Gets up and eats. Second time again, get up and eat. Then he eats sufficient enough to be able to run for a long period, 40 days and 40 nights. Beloved of God, I'm now, I'm, I'm now getting into a text, having known that background. And there he went into the cave and spent the night in that place. And behold, the word of God came to him. He said to him, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? Let's not rush into the text because the Bible says the word came to him. The word has always come to us from time immemorial. The word has never left us even when we feel alone. The word came means it is active. The word is traveling. The word is powerful. When Jonah was running away, the word came to him. When when, 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 when the Israelites were discouraged, God sent his word through Ezekiel. When Jeremiah, God wanted to use him, the word came to him. The word of God is active and powerful. The word does not return to God void. They, I like, but I like how the word is saying, take note of the specificity and the intentionality. It says, the word, the word came to him 
said to him, what are you doing here? Is it that God did not know what he was doing? May I say, there is no distance that is too far when the word is omnipotent. There is no place we can say that you've gone so far, the word cannot reach. There is no place that you can say it's so deep or dark for the word to reach. The word went, pursued Jonah even down there. It is that word that will take those who are asleep from their graves. It is that word that pursued Jonah when he was going down and down and down in his life. The word is never too dark because the word is also the light. The word, you may walk, you may have walked far, but the word says that God is just a step away from you. Beloved of God, I'm here to remind us that the word is present in this auditorium. For those who are watching us, the word is watching you. The word is with you, encouraging you not to give up. The word is powerful to penetrate even in your congregations. Beloved, I want to now invite us to continue to look at this. The response Elijah will give in verse 10. So he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts. For the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with a sword. I alone am left and seek to take my life. This guy is so depressed that he feels all alone. There's a slogan in one of the football teams that say, you will never walk alone. You know, but they still walk alone sometimes. They walk alone even when they're beaten. They walk alone. It says, you'll never be alone. So Elijah's response is saying, he's saying that, you know, I've been, I'm left alone. No, Elijah, you're not answering the question, Elijah. You ask, God simply asks, what are you doing here? Elijah is giving an answer about what he's doing, yet Elijah is doing nothing. Sometimes you feel like you're busy in our congregations and you ask what you're doing. You feel as though you're working, but you're doing nothing. What are you doing in this congregation? I like to sum up three groups of people in, in the congregation. We have people that I call, this is my English, I'm coining, they're called retailers. You get to the church, they're historians. They'll tell you, when we founded this church, you are not there. We were at city, I don't know. No, 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 I didn't say that. We, we, were, we have been there. Yeah, they're historians. You, we went Calvin Rock. No, no, I'm not speaking about anyone. I'm saying they're historians. They're telling us, you were not there. When, 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 when we moved to, 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 to what, I, what, I forgot that. I used to be there, by the way. We, we moved to uh, that, that, Polly, Polly, Polly. They're historians. So they'll always give you the history, history and history. You know, the question is, where are you? Are you a historian? The second group of people are retired. They are carved and they're caved. They're just in church. They can't do nothing in church. I'm too old. I think my time has passed. You guys, young people, you can take over. So they're always assuming their seats. They have what I call carry my bones mentality. They just ready to be buried home. Carry my bones mentality. They're just coming and, you know, they, they, they're sitting there watching things happen. Then there's another group of people in church who are called revived. Amen? They are creative. They are charismatic. They are willing to take the gospel from this point to the next generation. Beloved of God, with all those, those definitions, it is time to ask yourself, how faithful have you been with the, with the treasure and your talent? It's true that even as we continue to preach this gospel, there are people who've taken seats and forgotten why God has called them. Verse 11, then he said, go out. Now this is God. After he had talked, God says, told, told him, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by and a great and strong wind tore with the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. This is what some, in English of the theologians, they call it theophany, the appearance of God. This is my second point. Elijah experienced theophany of God. 
God passed by his, in his creative genius through great, a great and strong wind, earthquake, fire, but he revealed himself through a still, small voice. Beloved of God, God revealed to him, to himself to this person through a still, small voice. Now that mountain was a monumental visual audio experience. I call it visual audio experience because probably they saw the rocks, probably saw these things, but God chooses to be heard. That audio is what mattered the most. A still, small voice. Sometimes we want to see God visually. You want to see him, but he's saying, no, 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 no. I'm, I just want you to hear. I, God is saying, I just want you. Let the little children come unto me. And he says, I, you know, I'm used to this. My son is always doing that. So, I'll, amen. We pray, let the little children come unto me. Uh, I want to say this now. Uh, and say, God sometimes wants to speak to us, not through what you're seeing. In the noise around you, do you even take time to listen to God? God spoke to Elijah through a small voice. We are surrounded by so much noise around us. They can be tribal, can be political, can be hate and all these things, race and everything. But God wanted Elijah not to allow his fear subside his faith. God is not li limited in his active service to the lost humanity. God is not limited. He is still pursuing us. Thank you, ma'am. God is still pursuing us even to the core. Elijah's ethical response was not to be his historical experience. You know, he's talking about, I've been zealous. And that's why I told you church has different kind of people. Elijah is talking about his past. No, no, no. God wasn't asking Elijah about his past experience. Elder Mayaka, not about your past experience. The Bible says, he said, you know, he responded and said, I've been zealous. No. It's not about his spirit, but his present revelation. When is the last time you gave a testimony of what God is doing to you today? God acts through acts, works through acts and deeds. Beloved, Elijah had to learn to be the hearer of the word. He had to be reminded to be a hearer and doer of the word. You know, it reminds me of Genesis chapter 3 when God had talked to Adam and Eve. But they chose to buy the lie that was sold to them. They was listening to other foreign stories. May I remind us that Elijah chose to listen to the information that came from Jezebel. Are you listening to Jezebel around you that causes you to run away from doing what God has called you to do? What cave are you in today? It's dark, yes, but where are you? The church has different Departments in church, including what we know, now know as PCM, Public Campus Ministry. It is one neglected department in church, and the young people have been left to take care of themselves. Personally, I, have told, you, I told you that I serve in the campus ministry, and I can confirm to you that sometimes I get questions that are really shocking, and I'm like, how do I mentor all these people? Because I, where are the parents in this where are the children with these text messages? Where, where, who is here to support them to stand firm? New Life Church, we've been called not just to be a historical church. Amen? God is calling us to work beyond where we are. Even your listener, God is calling you to move from where you are to go reach out to other people. I know we are comfortable. We've done chaplaincy ministry. But there are young people in in the campus ministry, who are struggling to live better lives. You know, Elijah is reminded that prayer, prophecy never came the will of man, but God, but holy men of God spake as God, uh, as were moved by the Holy Spirit. What cave are you in today? The word that spoke to Elijah was the antidote of every trial. And that's the antidote today. I want to mention a couple of things as I come near to the conclusion. In this encounter, theophanic encounter of Elijah and God, we see the redemptive aspect of God. The redemptive aspect of this encounter was a reminder that God had acted in the past. Through the fire, 
through the wind, through the earthquake, in act of deliverance for his people against the enemies. So whenever they could hear earthquake, it will remind them how God had done that in the past. God chose to redeem this person by what he had done in the past. Through the wind, through the fire, Elijah had seen God do stuff in, in his life. The Bible says, to the, 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 the point is, what is the redemptive aspect in your life that God has done in your life? The other point I want to raise, the eschatological aspect. This is, was, it was in the redemptive acts of God in still actively involving him, it, it, that God was showing him that he was still actively involved in this life of redeeming Elijah. The work was not limited for that moment. Elijah felt like it was time to die, but God still had a plan, a continuous purpose for his future. Now, the other point I want to raise is the combination of Elijah, historical past and present and future should awake the immense responsibility at the present. If God Walk to Elijah through his past events. If God spoke to Elijah through the past experience, then you and I should know that God is still in need of us to work for the future. I'm basically saying that in church we need those who have passed the history. We also know, need those who have the present conviction to be able to help us know the direction you're taking. That is why we have launched the PCM yet again to remind people that it's not too late for us to go forward together. Therefore, our calling, another point, our calling, our calling and action, it's not just supposed to be vertical towards God. Some of us are feeling like, ah, but I have a relationship with God. And I just said, I've been zealous for God for all this time. He was, sure, he was saying the truth. He had a relationship with God. That is most what most of us say, but I'm, but I'm baptized already but I return my tithe and offerings, but I'm in the church. That's a vertical relationship. Probably that's the statement Elijah is making. But our calling is not just a vertical, but there's also an horizontal responsibility. Elijah had a relationship with God, but there was still work for him to do horizontally. Is it possible that you are chilling or sitting down here and left the work of knowing that we are priesthood, Beloved of God, hey, there's this quotation from the, our higher calling, says this, page 151, verse 3. It says, uh, stands, um, paragraph 3, says, There is no limit to the usefulness of one who, putting aside se self, makes room for the working of the Holy Spirit upon his heart and lives in a life wholly consecrated to God. If his people will remove the obstructions, he will pour forth the waters of salvation in abundant streams through human channels. I, is that diffi is, I thought you guys speak in English. Let me do it again. Please listen. I'm, I've read in English. There is no limit to the usefulness of one who putting aside self makes room for the working of the Holy Spirit upon his heart and lives a life wholly consecrated to God. If his people will remove the obstructions, he will pour forth the waters of salvation in abundant streams through human channels. He still wants to do that today. The Holy Spirit still work, wants us to work a collaboration. Are you sure you are on the path that God has called you today? Are you sure that you're involved? When Elijah was about hesitant and giving those questions, it seems as though he didn't un understand the question. Because in verse 13, he offers his rapper himself, and repeat, uh, then again the question will come in verse 13. So it was when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. Suddenly, a voice came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? Remember the first part, the voice, it was the word that came. Then now we are told, suddenly, a voice came. And the question was repeated to Elijah. Elijah, unadu? Elijah, unadu? Eli, you know, what's your language of Jana? Eli, unadu? Eli, unadu? And he's like, I'm a kid, I'm a kid, I'm a kid. Ah, unafanya. What are you doing? And that's what he's asked. But it seems he fails to get to know. Elijah was doing nothing. And he was, he was doing nothing. Because in verse 14, 
And he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord, O God of hosts, because the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant and torn down the altars and killed your prophets with a sword. I alone am left and they seek to take my life. When Elijah said that, the Lord said to him, go, return. Because he wasn't doing nothing. He was doing nothing. Elijah was told, go back, return. When Elijah will expect, will have expected to be told, you know that you, my, you are my son. No, 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 no. He was told, go back and do. I, there's a song that says, he giveth more grace when the burdens grow greater. He sendeth more strength when the labors increase. To added affliction, he added mercy. To multiply trials, he's multiplied peace. Elijah was depressed. He had gone to hide in the cave. But you know, when God met, met him, he reminded me the text in the book of Lamentation that says, sorrow may last for a while, but joy comes in the morning. God had met this guy. He was told, you know what? I still have work for you. You are not done. When he felt he was alone, he wasn't alone. Because God himself showed up in his situation. When you feel alone, like you're depressed, things are getting so difficult. Beloved of God, I want to challenge you. Think about God. He is present there. He has not ceased to be God. He is still in the ministry of shaping us to what he wants us to be. You know the same story in the book of Genesis. Uh, I think it must be Genesis 32. I'm just going to say it in listening. We find this guy called Jacob. He's been on the run for a long time. He has deceived his family brother. He, has, he is a deceiver, running away for a long time. I think I need to read it. I have a Bible here. It's, you know, my Bible is still active. I don't have to charge it. It's right here. And you, you get a story about this person called Eli, Jacob. Jacob is another man of God. He's been in the ministry. He's lied. Then he runs away. He decides to go back in Genesis 32 verse 22. And he arose that night and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his 11 sons, and crossed over the ford of Jebbuk. He took them, sent them over the brook, and he say, sent over them that he had, what he had. Then verse 24, I, I love this verse. Verse 24. Then Jacob was left, was left, alone. It's true sometimes in this life you need to be left alone. You figure out, am I in the right path? The Bible said Jacob was left alone. It's that moment when you are left alone that you can able to wrestle sometimes. Because that's when Elijah felt he was by himself. But God was present with him. So when Jacob wrestles, that's when now God begins to give you a good new name and reminds him about his mission. I see a striking similarity with Elijah because when he felt like everything was difficult, God was actually making it even better for him. And you know, he thought that by going back home, he's going to meet Esau. But Esau was all excited waiting for him. And after he had wrestled, his name was changed, of course, he, in verse 26 says, and he said, let me go for the day breaks. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Say to him, what is your name? You see these questions, you, uh, there are many questions in the Bible. Then he said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel, for you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, saying, Tell me your name, I pray. And he said, why is it that you also ask about my name? I told you the Bible is full of questions. God likes asking questions. And he blessed him there. And the Lord is saying, whatever the difficult things you have today, I want to bless you there. Not like, like here, here, here. What are you doing here? God wants to bless you here. The question is, are you willing to be used of God? Back to our text. I want to remind us the word comes and the word promise he'll come back again. Even the rushes fell trials, but God has promised us to overcome. I came up across this, this story 
that was in the Fox newspaper in January 13. January 13 yeah, that must be January 13, 20, um, 2015. It's a story about it's a story that took place in Istanbul. One of the very rare stories. There were some shepherd taking care of sheep. But they were having breakfast that morning in Istanbul, Turkey. And while having breakfast, one sheep went in the cliff, cliff and it fell down. And several started following. I know you don't understand this because you don't have sheep here. But I'm telling you because I have sheep, I have seen sheep where I stay. One by one, you know, when the, when the first one leads, the other one starts going down. And, and many followed. About 450 of them died. You know, where were the shepherds? They were having breakfast. And many of them, about 1,500, will follow following down. This was a very, it was a big news. It's never happened in a very, it's never happened actually. Maybe it's happened again. But this story was in the news everywhere. That there were sheep that fell down and many followed them. Maybe we need, we need shepherd who can show the sheep the right direction. The sheep was alone in isolation. But they were to be brought back by the shepherd. But this Elijah also has sheep and he has left them by themselves and they are falling off. And sometimes, or maybe in this context, I feel like we are these sheep sometime, shepherd sometime. We've been given this army of young people on campus to just help nurture them. We're like, oh, we're taking breakfast. No, 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 whatever. We're taking breakfast. The book of Ezekiel chapter 34 verse 6 says this. Ezekiel 34 verse 6. The book of Ezekiel 34 verse 6 says this. My sheep wandered through all the mountains, campus, and on every hill, every campus. Yes, my flock, my students, has scattered over the whole face of the earth. The whole of Nairobi, Kenya, or maybe in Kenya. Taking it again. My sheep wandered through all the mountains and on every high hill. Yes, my flock was scattered over the whole face of the earth and no one was seeking or searching for them. What a painful incident. No one was seeking, and seeking for them. The way sometimes we, uh, this department is not a big thing. I'm telling you, there's a powerful department called PCM. And they're the, they're the actually leaders of this church today. Buona if you are university students. I'm talking to my university students. Buona if you are. Yeah, to me, we've neglected them. And we're like, ah, they'll just come and do that. You're like right now, I believe that um, we will invited tomorrow for the concert. I pray that we support them. Amen? Yeah, let's not let, the, let them get, feel isolated, rejected, dejected like Elijah. But you see, when people, when God saw that his sheep were neglected, in verse 11, says, for thus says the Lord God, indeed, I myself will, will search for my sheep and seek them out. God went even seeking in his relentless pursuit. He went for Elijah and found him and found him out of the cave. As a shepherd seeks out his flock on the day he is among his scattered sheep, so I will seek out my sheep and deliver them from all the places where they were scattered on a cloudy and dark day. Amen. God is willing to seek out and save them, to bring them out. These sheep in our present context are our campus students. They are scattered some of this, them are disorganized. I, I'm telling you a fact. Disorganized. Some are depressed. Some are desperate for survival on campus. Not just in public campus ministry. We, we also have Christian or religious campus that are not Adventist. And no one is taking care of them. They rely on us. They are eager to be supported. They are eager for mission. I remember in 2015 when we were, we were going to Matu, there's a group from UN that came that we could support them. 
Elder Gwen, if you remember, those days when we went to Matu Mission, because they know they can bank, they can trust the church to help them. They can help the church to support them in nurturing the people. But the question is, have we abandoned them? I know this church is one of the most powerful churches in, in Kenya that has an active chaplaincy ministry. I'm not talking about a chaplaincy ministry, an active one, amen? This is an active one because I was in chaplaincy ministry also. But now, can we take it a notch higher and just go on campus, find this sheep and bring them back? The Bible, the, 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 my, my, my own testimony, I can say that even while I moved from this place to go to Machakos, I have received many guests from, my, from this church. Very many people, including like last Sabbath. Actually, last Sabbath is Dr. Wangai and wife that ministered at Machakos University. I know I am a, I have a beneficiary of PCM, but can we even support the ministry even by our presence, presence, Kwenda, and our presence, amen? Presence, Zawadi. Eh? Can we just help them to move forward? I know one of the recognized personnel that we have in this uh, ECD is Elder Opere Nyaroa. He's known and he's been interviewed even online over this department. But how can we make it go to the next level that the church can, we can feel the presence of God even when we are sitting in this, ministry, this place? We need to partner with God supporting the campus ministry. Beloved, I started by telling the story of Harry Tubman. Harry Tubman, the Savior is waiting. Harry Tubner, Tubman was, was a very vocal lady, 29. And, and as she took her time, the choristers, I think, should be here. And she took her time to, to save others. She had been raised, she had been warned. She, she was been warned that she, even though she was married to a free man, Don Tubman, she wasn't free. Something had to happen in her life. And when she was able to find salvation, it was wise for her to go and bring the others. Beloved of God, there's no room for backbenchers in the work of God. There's a responsibility that each one of us have been given to take this gospel a notch higher. I want to challenge us to consider reconsecrating ourselves for service to support the lost ship. Like I started, I'll, start, I'll give you the, last, the same question. What are you doing here? Beloved, what are you doing here? When the young people are depressed, when the young people are forsaken, when the young people in campus are hopeless, the question remains, what are you doing here? I'm making a call that for sure you've known that for sure you've never been involved in this ministry. But you have some resource, maybe a counselor, maybe you have, you have finances, maybe you have mentorship capability of going out to reach out to the young people, I want to challenge you today to take an action of giving and supporting the church. I know a few of you have, have done this. Elder, I think Elder Rastas has been to KMTC. A couple of you have been there and you can see the need is immense. We, we, we need to come back to our senses and get out of our caves. It gets dark in the cave. But can I tell you the, the good news is? The Savior is waiting. Two eight nine. The Savior is waiting to enter your heart. Why don't you let him come in? There's 
nothing in this world to keep you apart. What is your answer to him? Time after time, he has waited before, and now he is waiting again to see if you're willing to open the to time he is waiting before and now he is waiting again to see if you're Beloved of God, um, making this gentle appeal. The Savior has been waiting over and over again to see whether he'll open your heart and let it come in to be involved in his work. Time after time, the Lord has been waiting. He's whispering, pleading, and asking that you and I may be involved in this ministry. He's asking my video viewer listener, wherever you are, that he wants to col col collaborate with you in this ministry. There, there, there are young people there who sometimes don't have someone to support. There's a lady, a young man who's struggling, probably because of drugs. And maybe the mentors are just in this congregation. The people struggling to know where do they go past this place. The Savior is waiting. And I want to make an appeal that you want to be involved to support this ministry. Only those who are willing to support. That God may use us to make this work. You may take a stand for Christ. Stand. As the save is waiting. If you want to, I want to support. I'm like, you're like, Pastor Chaplain, for sure we need to support these young people. And in your heart you're convinced we need to support, get on your feet. If you're watching me and you're convinced that for sure the Savior is looking for us to do this, please support. We can do the second stanza of the chorus as we wait for those who will rise to support this ministry. If you take one step toward the Savior, my friend, you'll find me
Shall you pray? Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, the question has been brought to us today as we listen to your still small voice. You've asked us, where are we? It's probable, it's possible, it's so obvious that maybe we are on our pews. Lord, again, you've tested and asked us a question, where are we? Maybe to call our attention to the realization that we've abandoned the responsibility that you've set before us. The Savior know you've been waiting to find collaborators to fulfill this great commission in unentered areas. In your vision, you saw it well that we might search for the lost sheep to the uttermost because you said they are your sheep. Lord, we are willing to partner with you to seek and to find them because your work is to seek and save that which is lost. And today there are brothers and sisters who've made a step, a bold step, by requesting your abiding presence to be with them as they stand firm to support this ministry in the campus. I know in this place there are others who will support emotionally. Some will support spiritually. Some will support financially. Whatever the situation that is before us that can help us move from our cave to step out and go. Lord, I'm willing that you may use me together with the brothers and sisters to reach out to these souls. Times are difficult, people are desperate, people are depressed. But I pray and thank you, Jesus Christ, because you've confirmed to us that you are never alone. In our difficult tasks and challenges of our lives, Jesus Christ, we plead with you that you may show up. Show up because you're not done with us. Show up because, God, we are willing to go the way with you. Show up because even in our hunger, you provide food. Even in our thirst, Lord, you provided water for us to drink. Whatever the need that may be here today, invite us to be able to revise our agenda, to look up to you. Yes, in this vertical relationship, but also, Lord, to be willing to be involved horizontally to bring people into the fold. Jesus Christ, you've spoken. And we are listening. We pray that continue to speak to us in the way you've chosen. In Jesus' name we pray.